Welcome to the NISG 3D HP for the Nation monthly forum, August 21, 2024. And we're fortunate today to have USGS with us to talk about the spatial integration of hydrography and elevation data. Uh, as most of you are well aware, this is a cooperative agreement between USGS and NISGIC to engage state and local governments and private sector in the derivation of a national stream network. Uh, first update uh, since the topographic maps, so national scale. Uh, before we get into the presentation, I want to just give you a quick update on what we're doing uh, project-wise. As you know, uh, one of our first tasks over here on the right is to facilitate information webinars, and that's where we are today. Uh, thank you all for joining us. If you would like to go back and look at some of our previous webinars, uh, and I'll put these uh, links in the chat in just a minute, uh, Emily has done an outstanding job of moving um, our content from the previous learning link environment into the NISGIC knowledge base. So you can go to the knowledge base and access materials there. Emily, is that still going to be a login requirement to access materials? Uh, no, not for the not for 3DHP content in the in the knowledge base, like all the forums and stuff. Those should just be publicly available. Thanks so much. Mm -hmm. Uh, in addition, we have the 3DHP for the interest interest group. Uh, most of you are aware this is an interest group where we discuss um, the federal program, our project activities, and your 3DHP related activities. Uh, we interrupt our forum uh, three times a year for these interest group meetings. And so uh, we did have a June interest group meeting where we talked about the culvert mapping good practices. And thanks to that dialogue, we are have a final draft very near publication. If Phil stops adding comments, um, <laughs> we always, Phil has some great ideas that need to get in there. Um, and then we will meet again on September 24th during the annual conference. We'll have a 3D, uh, 3D NTM breakfast uh, in the, at 3D NTM breakfast with, so we'll have that in conjunction with the 3 Dep for the Nation project. And that'll be 7.30 a.m. Um, it is tentative for Tuesday right now, um, and we will update that if it changes, but right now it's tentative for Tuesday. You can always check the NISJIC annual meeting conference. That is in person only. We will not, uh, that meeting will not be recorded or um, uh, televised. If you're interested, sorry, <laughs> I've got a little delay here. Okay, if you're interested in joining, the interest group. If you're a NISJIC member, you can join at mynisjic.com and it'll ask you to log in. If you're not a NISJIC member, it's not a problem. Uh, you set up an, an account and most of you by virtue, and Emily can correct me, by virtue of being in this webinar, you've already set up an account with the site. Uh, you will then go to mynisjic.com, log in, and then you can select from the various communities and join the 3DHP for the interest group community. Is that correct? Emily, that if yeah. they've log that they've registered for the conference, yeah. then yeah, if you're already here, you there. probably already have a login. And just a real quick correction, my.nistrict.org. Ah. Don't know where .com will take you, but <laughs> probably not to the right place. All right. Well, I will fix that. Thank you. No worries. Been on there for months. Okay. In addition, there is a hydrography stewards community. Um, this was uh, originally formed out of the. NHD stewards, but it actually involves anybody in your state that is managing hydrography data uh, for your state, you are welcome to join. Uh, that group was able to meet up at the ESRI conference, and those notes have been distributed. Had a great meeting on August 6th with USGS to address some of the issues or questions that came up. Um, that group is open to NISJIC members, and you can join that group. Again, you'll have to fill out a, this one, you'll have to fill out a form. Let me go ahead and, and uh, put these URLs into the chat. All right, in the chat now, you have the link to the knowledge base, uh, the 3DHP for the Nation Info Hub, the interest group, the Hydrography Stewards Forum, and we'll talk in a minute about the uh, offsite activity forum. Um, I do, I do see Jane is on the call, and 
so is Josh. Do either of you have anything? Jane and Josh are nice enough to uh, facilitate the hydrography stewards community. Do either of you have anything you'd like to share with the group while we've got everybody here? Uh, this is Jane. We do not have any meetings scheduled um, at this point. The uh, the notes, as you mentioned, from the uh, both the meetings in July and August um, are up on that community page. That's all. Great. Thank you. Thank you all. Uh, some of the current activities we're working on, um, as I mentioned in that uh, June meeting with the interest group meeting, we were able to vet the culvert mapping good practices document. That has been back and forth a few times, and uh, we're, that we hope to have that um, document finalized and available for distribution at the annual conference. Of course, it'll be available online, but we'd like to have some, uh, we're hopeful to have some handouts at the conference. Um, as always, our inventory of state 3D hydrography experiences. Phil does a great job of keeping that site uh, maintained. Your contributions and updates are needed. So again, if you're involved in EDH and 3DHP activities in your state or your organization, uh, we'd love to have a, a little bit of a, uh, it's just a little bit of a survey of your experiences and maybe links to your resources, links to your products, things like that. So um, we would love to have your information in there. The 3D NTM data acquisition planning guide, we've been working hard and fast on that for this last year. I feel like we've got a really good working draft. And that was developed in preparation for the 3D HP planning workshop that's going to be held Monday morning at the annual conference. And I'll talk about that again in the morning, but that'll be Monday morning. So those of you that are attending the conference, please uh, plan your travel accordingly. It'll be an early one. And again, all of this information in, is, is posted at the um, 3D HP for the Nation Info Hub. Oh, and then the annual conference. I just wanted to kind of run over some of the activities we have. There, as I mentioned, the 3DHP planning workshop um, Monday morning. That has been shortened. We had had it, uh, it's 8 to 10 a.m., so we're down to two hours. Uh, we're going to get as much done as we can. And there will be registration for that workshop, and you'll see that distributed here. Just got to get with Emily to get that set up. Uh, we will have the 3D NTM breakfast breakout. Again, that's with 3 up on Tuesday morning. And that's where we give brief project updates and the participants share their activities as well. Uh, we are planning a 3D HP offsite activity Tuesday afternoon. For those of you that are not participating in the golfing outing, uh, you are welcome to join us. It's probably going to involve lunch, boating, and some form of discussion. We, we've got a small team working on that. Uh, we would appreciate, uh, excuse my typo there. Let me fix that. Um, we would appreciate if you would sign up. Um, so we have a, a some measure of who's interested. Oh my goodness, I should have done a lot of spell check before. Uh, who's in, in other words, how many folks are interested? So if you can, uh, please sign up. It does not, it's not a commitment. It's just that we know that you may have interest in, and we know if we're talking about 10 people or 40 people. So that link again is in the chat. Please use that. And we've submitted an abstract, as most of you know, this is the end of a four year project. Um, there is conversations between NISDIC and USGS to continue. So we don't necessarily think it's the end of the project, uh, but we will have a roundup, yeehaw, going to Texas, right? And uh, we've submitted an abstract, and we'll talk about our project outcomes and resources. So if you're going to the conference, we uh, hope to see you there. Now, with that said, <laughs> I'd like to introduce William Schulstad. Did I say that right, William? Will? Yeah, that's definitely close enough. <laughs> Would you? Okay, please say it for us so that we know. Just Schulstad, pretty easy. Schulstead. Okay, I keep trying to put that J in there. No worries. And uh, Ryan Gillespie, they're both with the National Geospatial Technical Operations Center, and they're going to be talking to us today about the ABCs of XYZ, uh, integrating the hydrography and elevation data. And with that said, I will stop sharing and turn the presentation over to w Will and Ryan. Great, thank you, Linda. Sorry, the camera is screwy. 
Uh, this is this is me. I'm a human with a face. That's about enough of that. Let's go to the presentation. <clears throat> Okay, can everyone see that? Yes. Okay, great. All right, yeah, thank you again for the introduction, Linda, and uh, thank you for inviting us. Um, as the name implies, we're here to talk about the ABCs of XYZ. Um, really, uh, we just want to um, talk about how we as the USGS validate um, this EDH data and, and see how well it's fitting into the horizontal and vertical dimensions. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about why that matters and, um, and how we do it. Uh, so again, I'm here with my colleague, Ryan Gillespie. We're both, um, like Linda said, we're both from the National Geospatial Technical Operations Center. I'm based in Denver, he's in Rolla, so we're a little spread out, but we make it work. Um, all right. So a little overview, we're just gonna talk about why do we need to improve spatial integration between these products? Um, we'll, we'll talk about the future, what the, uh, this is not my baby, but we'll talk a little bit about what the 3D national topography model is um, and, and where we fit into the pipeline um, here. Uh, we'll talk about the 3D elevation program, the, the source elevation data that we use um, to create uh, our data, the, the EDH data. Um, once we get into the 3DHP, the 3D hydrography program, uh, I'm not gonna <laughs> belabor some of these points because I think this audience uh, intimately knows what some of these programs are, but um, inside the 3D, uh, 3DHP umbrella, we're gonna talk about elevation derived hydrography, what it is, um, a little bit about how it's made. Um, then we'll talk about the standards and specifications uh, and the guidelines that are used um, by multiple uh, entities to create the data. And then we'll, you know, the bread and butter here is the validation. So if we're saying these things are integrated, how are we checking that it's integrated? Um, and, and what is, what's the, um, the outcome? It, are they integrated or not? We'll take a look at that at the end. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, the why, <laughs> Linda, you had a great segue into this talking about uh, topographic maps. Uh, again, I think this audience uh, is going to know right where we're right where we're coming from and right where we're going. Um, but you know the 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 initial question is why do we need to do any of this? Um, but we we know in the hydrography world that rivers are dynamic; they're they're not static on the landscape. They can meander slowly over time. Uh, they can reroute themselves rapidly during a high flow event. Um, we we know that rivers change, uh, so our hydrographic features have this temporal element that we always have to consider. Um, and it's especially um, important to consider when we have uh, hydrography data that may not be very uh, temporally accurate. You know, some of the, some of the topo maps um, have hydrography that hasn't been remapped for a long time uh, in the positional dimension. Uh, and then we have, we have other data sources that um, are collected much more recently and at much higher resolution and uh, you know, are available for use. So if we take a look at some of these examples, you know, the, this is the same area from um, <clears throat> the topo map on the previous slide. And we look at arrow one and arrow two, you can see, all right, uh, if, I'm if I'm just an Esri user, if I'm looking at NHD compared to some imagery, you're gonna start to notice some differences. You're gonna see maybe some natural meanders um, around arrow one. You're gonna see that the river seems to have maybe completely change course um, in the south by arrow two. And you're gonna start to start to wonder a little bit about how good this data is. And if we take a look at one of these um, one of these data sources that we have access to, the, you know, these are our data. This is just three depth one meter data. Um, it kind of confirms those suspicions we see an example one that, yeah, the, the historical channels for both of these um, paths are likely, or, you know, are, are sort of still there on the elevation surface, but the channels that we saw in the imagery that differed from the NHD um, are clearly established. They're in size, they're deep, they're, um, they're long. They, uh, <laughs> they look like um, they're, they're following the imagery much more closely than the historic mapping does. 
So, you know, circling back to the why, why are we doing this? <clears throat> why does it matter? Well, we think perceptions matter and we think science matters. Um, on the left, this is this is what an S3 user, or excuse me, you know, a GIS user might see. Um, if they have the imagery service turned on in, a, in an application, um, imagery isn't everything. We, we know that a lot in hydrology and hydrography, but when there's apparent incongruities between the hydrography and the imagery data, it can lead to perceptions that our data are inaccurate or outdated or both. Uh, we don't want that perception. We we care an awful lot about our data and we want it to be as um, as accurate as possible. You know, the other thing is that science matters. We can't have um, completely out of date, completely um, inaccurate and irrelevant data if we want to have um, science data that people, if we want to have data that the scientific community will turn to uh, when they're trying to solve problems. Um, so we, we aim to produce scientifically relevant hydrography data, which also means as much as possible, we need to be as temporally accurate as possible. We of course can't recollect one meter LIDAR data every day, uh, but if we have it, we can certainly use it to update um, our hydrography program data so that it's as accurate uh, as we can make it. Again, this is the, um, just a little, just a small slide to talk about where we fit into this whole pipeline in this program. You know, I mentioned the 3D national topography model. Um, I imagine some of you on this call know uh, more about it than I do, uh, but it's, it's essentially the USGS's vision for an integrated 3D model of elevation and hydrography data. Um, it'll support environmental climate change infrastructure applications um, and it responds to changing U.S. policies that will support federal, state, tribal, and non-governmental, local, and um, other stakeholder needs. Um, so to get to the 3D NTM, we use the 3D uh, elevation program baseline data <clears throat> excuse me, um, to derive hydrography for the 3D hydrography program. Um, that puts us right here in the middle. Uh, we are the elevation-derived hydrography uh, validation team. And so that's kind of where we sit in this big picture. Uh, sorry about the formatting. This slide always seems to uh, look a little different depending on how we're displaying it. But uh, I think all of you probably know, but the source elevation for the EDH program, which is of course then fed into 3DHP is uh, five meter IFSAR in Alaska, five meter or better. Um, and one meter or better LIDAR in CONUS. Um, this is, a lot of you will probably can tell, this is um, Denali up in Alaska and the um, uh, Great Sand Dunes National Park here in Colorado. So again, these are the, um, the base resolutions for the models that we use to drive our hydrography from. Um, for elevation drive hydrography, again, you know, this is the data that feeds the 3DHP program. Um, this hydrography data, um, for excuse me, for hydrography data that needs to, that is to be ingested into the 3DHP database, it must meet the elevation drive hydrography specifications, which are published in the EDH um, data acquisition specifications and the representation, extraction, attribution, and delineation rules. Uh, again, we also have a set of um, EDH guidelines that provide contractors with um, that are producing the data with supplements and clarifications to the uh, specifications. In this presentation, we'll focus on the specifications that define how surface flow line features must be integrated with the 3D elevation program uh, elevation surfaces and how we validate the incoming data to meet these specifications. Um, we, we actually do a, an incredibly robust check of um, the incoming EDH data. But again, uh, for to kind of put some bounds around this presentation, we really try to focus on uh, the few uh, main checks that help us determine whether or not that integration is um, being accomplished. Um, so up next, Ryan's gonna talk us through some of those checks and how we look at that integration. Ryan, you ready? Yeah, I'm ready. All right. Thanks, Will. Um, yeah, so first off, I'll say, you know, for all of our validation checks, we have to, just because of the scale of what 
at which we're working, which is of course uh, national. Um, and we are receiving tens of thousands of features every day uh, with only a handful of staff um, validating. Um, pretty, you know, we try to automate almost everything that we can uh, and to, to develop, um, yeah, automated checks to, to uh, verify that the specifications are being met. Uh, so like Will said, um, I'm going to be focusing on uh, how flowline features match the elevation surface. And one of the, the ways that we look at that is through a vertical integration. Um, so in, yeah, in a vertical dimension. The specification says that all lines uh, shall be at or just below the elevation value of the immediately surrounding terrain within one meter of the location on the bare earth uh, DEM. And uh, I guess something I want to point out there is that there is kind of a, we have, there's another specification I'm not going to go in, into as much um, depth about, but we also have a requirement that lines are monotonic meaning that they, they flow downhill, they, are, they don't go uphill at any point. Um, and so there has to be some kind of uh, wiggle room uh, so that it's possible to maintain monotonicity uh, through kind of a rough uh, elevation surface. So, so there's kind of um, wiggle room in the specification and it's, it's just below the uh, bare earth surface. Um, so that's, that's kind of where that comes from. And then for, for our validation checks, what we do is uh, el extract the elevation values from, from the DEM to uh, the line vertices, and then compare that value to the vertex Z coordinate. Uh, so just get the difference. And then we flag vertices for view if they're above the surface by any, any distance or more than one meter below the surface. Um, yeah, next slide, Will. Thank you. So this is kind of an example we're going to come back to for the next few slides of a, um, a little flow network in, in one of our deliveries. And yeah, you can kind of see just looking at the hill shade that through the through the middle of this image, it's you can kind of see where maybe you would have placed it if you were just drawing lines. Uh, there's kind of a crease that you can see in the hill shade. So I guess just take note of that and we'll kind of come back to it. Um, but for the flow line vertices on the left side, there's that yellow arrow that's pointing to a point feature that we got from one of our um, validation tools. That was a vertex that was below the surface. Uh, so you can kind of see in the hill shade that there's a little, little bump there and it's difficult to visualize because it's you know in the vertical dimension, it doesn't really map well, we'd have to look at some other kind of diagram. Uh, another reason that, that we rely on automation a lot. Um, but yeah, you can kind of see that that, must, that line must, the, the stream, excuse me, must be passing through that, that bump. Uh, and so that would, be, that would be an error that we would, um, that we would review. Next slide, please. And then for horizontal integration, um, the specification states uh, stream and other linear channel features features shall stay within the apparent channels in the elevation data and shall not leave the channel. So we validate this using a couple different checks. And one is to uh, model channelization and check whether the streams are inside the model channels. So to do that, we create uh, a geomorphic indicator raster, a uh, GMI. That's what we call it, so we don't have to say that. <laughs> I'm sorry to add to the uh, all of the uh, acronyms and initialisms. Uh, so yeah, that's our that's our channelization model. Uh, it is um, an elevation derivative that was developed by Sylvia Terziati, who is with the National Geospatial Program uh, in USGS. Um, it is an index based on multiple elevation derivatives that all. Um, attempt to model channelization and um, we should sort of add them together and create a single index that is more robust, especially to different um, uh, terrain types than any one derivative alone. Uh, so the, the four derivatives we, we use are G infinity flow accumulation, 
which um, is based on uh, local slope and how water flows and accumulates across the bare earth surface. Uh, geomorphons, which uses a pattern recognition approach uh, based on lines of sight and categorizes landforms um, such as valleys or depressions. Um, we use black top hat transform, which is an image processing technique that essentially finds low-lying areas smaller than a certain neighborhood. We use multiple neighborhoods. Um, and then multi-scale elevation percentile, which is a measure of relative topographic position. And we're essentially looking for yeah, low-lying areas uh, relative to their surroundings. Uh, and then any, any streams that aren't within uh, GMI identified channels are flagged for review. Um, so next slide, please. So back to our example with the GMI layer on. Um, so it's in kind of beige to red and uh, darker colors are indicating that uh, more of those derivatives show that there's a channel there or predicting a channel there, Mod excuse me, modeling. And you can kind of see through the middle that uh, there is a dark line of GMI, higher GMI values falling right where we saw that kind of crease in the hill shade. So um, that kind of matches uh, matches what you would see with your with your with the naked eye, but you know we can't just look at every single one. We have to we have to automate so that we can do this uh, at scale. Um, but actually what we would get from this check is on the right side there where there's the yellow arrow um, the line completely leaves um, the GMI uh, channel. So we, we would conclude you know, that there are no derivatives that say that there's a channel there. And so that, that's, that's what would actually be flagged for review. So then next slide, please. To look for um, whether the, uh, the kind of a, a smaller, excuse me, I always, I always get that wrong, smaller scale, larger scale. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I guess, large. well, sorry. So to check that the flow line is placed at the bottom of the channel, not just within a channel, um, we also uh, generate elevation profiles um, at regular intervals along streams. And if the flow line is not the lowest point along those profiles, then we review the flow line. So that's the same specification up at the top there. So this is just another way that we look at horizontal integration um, to, to kind of make sure that the, the placement is not only within a channel, but within it's, it's at the kind of most likely place where, um, where that stream actually is. Uh, next slide, please. So here's our example again with offset profiles added. So those are the kind of purple profiles perpendicular to the to the blue lines. And that's that's now um, finding what we kind of saw before, which is that this stream is not not the lowest place, not the lowest spot on um, in this valley. So those those profiles, uh, one side of them is lower than the stream. So it's, it's kind of up on the slope. So that's what this check finds. And we would, um, yeah, so we can all, and we also use all these outputs together to kind of get a full picture of, uh, you know, the, the placement uh, within the data set, the quality of the horizontal and vertical placement within the data set. Uh, and I do want to say that this is a cherry pick example. Uh, we usually see much better results than this. Uh, I just had to find something that, um, an example that, uh, where we could see the poor placement with our bare eyes. <laughs> um, so, yeah, that's uh, that's all I have for my section. Thank you, Will. Thanks, Ryan. Yeah, good good caveat there that this is not what uh, normal validation looks like, uh, but a great example. Uh, sorry, also about the uh, slide advancing. Uh, I think we found the one version of our PowerPoint that we hadn't fixed that on. So, my apologies. Okay, next we've just got a couple. So we we've talked to you about the specifications. We've talked to you about the goals, but uh, what what does it actually look like? How does this data look um, once we get it back, what, uh, once it's through validation? So uh, we're just going to talk a little bit about that and take a look at some real data. 
um, I've learned better than um, doing actual fully live demo. So I've got a recorded demo uh, and I'll just kind of talk you through what's going on while, as I'm taking a look at this. Um, so right now we just have a world terrain base map turned on in pro um, and it's got, I, th I assume an HD on it, but um, whatever it is, it's a little, little rough. Um, so yeah, again, just have a terrain base map with some hydrography features in there, a double line and some single line streams. Um, if we turn on the NHD network, um, you can see it doesn't even match up with whatever the um, uh, the base map that they had turned on was. So maybe this was um, generalized or simplified. I'm not sure, but uh, you know, if you were doing some work with both those layers, you'd start to raise an eyebrow pretty quickly, I assume. Uh, but then if we turn on uh, the dem in the area, you can see that that base map fading away in the background. Uh, and if we turn on the NHD flow lines again, you can see um, these probably, you know, we're pretty close at some point, but there's definitely some improvements that can be made. Uh, if we turn on the um, EDH polygons and the EDH flow lines, you can see the horizontal placement is drastically improved. Um, it matches the elevation surface uh, <laughs> incredibly precisely. Um, so for our checks that look at the horizontal placement, this is, this is what we're going for. We want to see um, streams flowing through valleys at the deepest part of the channel. We want to see um, 2D, you know, double line um, streams um, hitting the banks and following the banks perfectly, you know, as, as, as perfect as we have specified and as perfect as the, the LIDAR will allow. But, um, you know, this is, this is kind of what we're doing it for. I think if any of us were doing scientific or cartographic work, um, we would much more appreciate these features and their placement um, than, you know, the, the last version of these features. But again, you know, this is X, Y, and Z. This is not just uh, the ABCs of XY, uh, we care about the vertical uh, aspect with 3DHP and EDH data. And this is, this is um, an example of some data that we have um, in the validation process. Um, uh, of course, I've, I've draped the, um, the hill shade on top of the elevation surface, uh, but these, these flow lines are not draped. These flow lines are actually displayed with their Z value. Um, and, you know, they're in the same coordinate system is the dem and and this is this is what we're looking for uh sorry the the rendering is not always great so if it looks like it flashes in and out that's because uh, i think my machine was trying trying to keep up with me on this day um but there's a, a few places where everything lines up just right and you really get to see lines flowing down the steepest part of the canyon and um everything everything really laying where you would expect it to and so this is this is kind of the full circle here. You know, we want double line streams sitting in their banks. We want single line streams uh, in the deepest part of the channel. Um, we want high resolution mapping of these features. Uh, that's what we're asking our contractors to provide using our own um, elevation products from the three D elevation pro or the three yeah three D elevation program uh, to create this. EDH data that we ingest uh, eventually into the 3D HP data model. Um, and that's it. This is, this is why we're doing it. And, and, and this is, these are the results that we're getting using the validation checks that um, Ryan and a few others have developed uh, again to create a pretty robust set of automated and then um, re constantly reviewed checks to make sure that we, um, are not holding people accountable, but to, to make sure that our, our, our program is accomplishing what it has set out to accomplish. And that is um, three-dimensional three dimensional integration between these products. Um, here's a list of references. Um, if anyone's interested, I think the uh, a set of the slides will be available for use afterwards. Um, thank you very much for having us again, uh, Linda and Sue and everyone that got us on today. We appreciate you having us. And um, yeah, we're here for questions. Excellent. Um, we've got a few questions in the chat. I'm going to um, get somebody in the waiting. I'm going to encourage folks to add their questions. Uh, the first, I'm going to combine 
Ellen Ferris from Pennsylvania, Ellen from Pennsylvania asks, is there a white paper that covers the GMI workflow? Josh added, any definition of GMI would be helpful. And Sue commented that, uh, Sue Buto commented that you're working on incorporating more information about GMI into an upcoming uh, update release of the EDH acquisition specification. Um, would you, either of you guys like to add anything more to that? Uh, people looking, do you have any other resources where people are looking for information about GMI? Uh, thank you, Linda. That, that was great. You asked the questions and answered it all in one. <laughs> no, Sue answered uh, it. Yeah, thank you, Sue. That's exactly what I was going to say. We are, uh, the 2024 uh, draft specification will include an updated um, definition of, of how we use GMI in our work. Um, again, for the, 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 let me go backwards. For the GMI parameters that we use, um, we do have, you know, there are, a, there's a lot of work and there's white paper on the individual um, layers that go into it. But in terms of the, um, the layers that we use uh, for our GMI all packaged into one, I think the, the upcoming specification will probably be the, the most concise way to um, understand how we are using GMI. Ryan, Andrew, Sue, or anyone else, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, that covers it. Okay. Great. Yeah, agreed. Okay, great. Um, Aaron asks, does or will hydrography include bathymetry in this use case? Um, specifically as it pertains to EDH, uh, no and or not yet. Um, in, in the 3D national topography model, I know that inland bathymetry is um, on the horizon or, or somewhere in the plan, but but you know, for, for Ryan and I's work, we're, we're strictly EDH validation. And so for us, no, but uh, again, if anyone else on the call wants to speak to bathymetry, please do. I'll just hop in and say, well, yeah, you you are correct. The, the vision for the 3D national topography model is an integrated surface that includes um, inland bathymetry uh, along with the terrestrial um, elevation surface. Uh, we don't have current plans to include that as part of uh, hydrography, but who knows what will happen as we evolve the 3D national topography model. Right now, um, Will and Ryan and the rest of us have, have uh, a lot to do to get it, uh, just our hydrography just aligned with the, the elevation surface. We'll see where we go. Thanks. Thank you, Will. Uh, James from Kentucky asks, are there any plans to make the validation tools available to 3DHP partners? There are lots and lots of discussions. Um, it's, a, it's a pretty loaded question, no matter which way, if we were able to do it, um, there's, there's different options and avenues for how we could do it. And each one of them have um, some pretty um, large obstacles that we have to overcome. Um, for a lot of you, I know I know a lot of you um, used to be um, involved in our NHG stewardship program and um, things are different now than they used to be back then. We don't have uh, our organization structured in the same way um, currently to, to administer tools to the public and to data producers. Um, so, so things have just changed. Um, but again, to circle back to your question, there's a, there's a ton of conversations about it. Um, so if, if it's able to be done, um, we would be, I think a lot of us on the validation side would be very excited about it. Um, we want, you know, again, we're, we're trying to talk here today about how we're checking the data against the specification. Uh, and so if we have a, a, a novel way to do that, I, I would very much like to share it with anyone we can so that you guys can see what we're doing. Um, and, and particularly, uh, if I can just kind of um, to our own horn right now, a lot in a lot of arenas and, and a lot of times uh, the feds are not necessarily leading uh, at the technological front. Uh, but I think right now um, we very much are. We have, we have really, really talented people. Ryan Gillespie on the call uh, being one of them and some other colleagues of his that have worked um, to make some really incredible tools that um, I think it would be a shame not to be able to share those. So um, long governmental answer of, of not giving you an answer. I'm sorry about that, but 
uh, it's it's something that's talked about a lot. Um, and, and if we can make it happen, we certainly will. Thank you, James. It, oh, go ahead. Sue, did you have anything you wanted to add to that? No, I think you uh, you covered it quite well, Will, and I will I will echo that we have some seriously talented people working on this problem. We're lucky to have y'all. Yeah. Agreed. Yep. Larry, right. Can I ask a follow up question to that? Sir, certainly. Please. Josh, William, do, are you? Would you say you're keeping in close contact with the GPSC contractor, so at least they have the validation tools to check the results before they submit to you? Um, not, <laughs> I see Amanda's here. Thank you so much, man. I'll let you take that one. If, if you want to. We, we use teams at, at work and this is, yeah. so I imagine Amanda's looking for the mute button, but I see your hand up, Amanda. I'll give you no. a second. Can you hear me now? Yes. There you go. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I had to switch my microphone for some reason. But anyway, um, so yeah, thanks, Josh, and thanks, Will. And um, this is Amanda Lowe. I'm the Systems Development Branch Chief. So the teams who work on building our validation tools for 3DHP and also for 3DEP, um, one of the things that we're looking at right now is um, doing an assessment of all of our validation tools and determining which ones would be most beneficial to share with data producers. And so that's the first step. You know, we have to see which ones have dependencies on licensed software, um, which tools are, you know, if we're just using a, an off the shelf tool that we, you know, we can just describe the parameters we're using um, that's another scenario, but essentially we're, we're going to assess all of our tools, figure out which ones would be the most beneficial to share, and then we're going to start by sharing those with our GPSC contractors and then getting some information about um, what it would take to support those, sharing them more widely with other data producers. Um, so yeah, it's something we definitely want to investigate and we're, we're in the middle of doing that now and hopefully there will be some, you know, some tools that we can share more widely, but for now we're just, um, we're just looking at sharing those with GPSC data producers initially. Thank you, Amanda. You're welcome. Uh, Charlie asked, um, and I'll read the whole question. Matter, maybe a better question for offline, but as my understanding is that the Alaska IFSAR 5 meter bare earth DEM is the water surface. In braided stream valleys, there will be multiple water levels at different elevations in different channels. How does the model pick up the main channel when its water surface elevation might be higher than a neighboring sub-channel, or does it identify a main channel? Well, oh, Ryan, do you want to take this one? Sure, yeah. I guess uh, by by model, do you mean, which model do you mean? Are, you, are we talking about the GMI or um, yeah, the Charlie, profile? Charlie, feel, feel free to come off yeah. mute and elaborate. Yeah. Well, just when you're deriving the, um, when you're getting the elevation derived flow lines, I'm just curious how it knows what elevation to follow when you have varying water level elevations in different subchannels, neighboring subchannels. Um, yeah, I found trying to do it just uh, within ArcGIS tools that it sometimes is is um, doesn't necessarily pick what I would consider the main channel. So I was just curious if you had any um, advice on that. Yeah, that's a that's a good question, and I, I'm not sure if I can really answer it um, because we're not actually directly generating line work. Um, that's being done by, uh, you know, uh, data producers, contractors, partners. Um, so they're they're solving that problem. Uh, <laughs> as far as validation, um, you know, that uh, braid stream network networks are there. There are, are many kind of um, corner cases, I guess, <laughs> that you know. That we found by trying to, to um, by growing our specifications over time and dealing with new data conditions, that's definitely one of them. Um, I I would say 
the, the closest answer I can give you is that we don't really um, identify a main channel. Channel uh, we we kind of focus more on uh, making sure that the the whole width of the um, braided stream network is is captured and that ma major channels are captured. Um, yeah, as far as yeah, the main channel. There's probably some logic in 3DHP that I'm not uh, super up on when, once we actually already have the um, uh, we already have the line, line work. There's um, the, the kind of uh, main main path um, determining the main path that that happens as as part of a you know, the flow network derivatives. Um, but yeah, as far as as picking a path through a braided streams stream network, um, that's that's being done by uh, data producers and, and not by us. Thank you. Anybody from the private sector want to comment on that? Don't mean to put you on the spot. Guess not. Uh, Dennis from Tennessee asks, is the USGS NGTOC continuing to add staff to account for the data allocation? validation efforts for EDH, 3DHP. There's a concern for many states that are submitting or have submitted a DCA proposal. Yeah, I can take that one. We've we've definitely added staff this year. Um, luckily, I'm not high enough up to be privy to what's happening in, in the years beyond. Uh, but yeah, we certainly work very closely with um, our, you know, our partners at NGP, um, to look at how much data is going to be coming our way and make sure we're as well prepared to deal with that data as possible. Um, you know, could could things go this way or that, of course, uh, but, uh, you know, to more directly answer your question, yes, this year we've added, a, we've, we've probably increased our staff by about 50%, I, I think, on the validation side. So we're definitely trying to grow. You've increased your staff just this last year by 50%? For this activity, Ryan, am I, I'm, I'm pretty on the nose there, right? Uh, I don't want to say names on the call, but I'm trying to count in my head. I think I think we're pretty close to that in terms of new hires directly uh, working on validation. That sounds right to me. All right, that, but you didn't go from two to four, right? No, I mean, two to, <laughs> two to one, three, sorry. One and a half <laughs> to three, yeah. Exactly. Sorry, yeah, from yeah. two to three. All right, sorry, guys. Um, uh, Matt asks, on slide 15, maybe we could go back since your presentation is still up, Will. Why is the downstream example of an error in stream placement considered an error? Error. I don't see my, oh, there we go. This one? Matt, yeah. can you come um, off if yeah. you've got the right yes. one? Okay. Yes, that, uh, it's that uh, downstream example. Um, I was just wondering, it looked like from the GMI and the and the hillshade that that stream was going through the, the, the path, the lowest pathway. And I just wanted to understand why you called that, pointed that out as a error in placement. Yeah, it's, uh, I think we'd have to, to uh, zoom in to see the issue, uh, which unfortunately is just an image, but um, yeah, it, when you do zoom in, you can see that the the line goes completely outside of the GMI. Uh, it's not far away, but it is out, outside the um, the model channel, and um, the the profiles also are showing that the uh, there is a lower uh, that you know that the actual channel right next to it, I think, just to the south, is is lower. Um, in elevation, so um, and, and I didn't didn't get into it. We do we do actually have a threshold for that too, which, gosh, um, I don't remember exactly off the top of my head what it is. I could look it up really quickly, but there, um, yeah. So it's it's difficult to see at this scale, but it you know if you zoom in, it it does. It's not in the model channel, and it's also the profiles are showing that there's a lower elevation nearby. Yeah, if, if you zoomed in, you'd essentially see what we see here in the center where the channel is up slightly on the ridge. We're just, yeah, like Ryan said, we're just 
uh, zoomed pretty far out to capture a, a broader area here. Yeah, thank you. Of course. Um, yeah, Charlie asked, is there a plan for change detection? Can Charlie, can you be a little more specific? Uh, you know, what you're trying to get at there? Uh, apparently, I don't, I'm not good at asking questions. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. Um, uh, just to see over the course of time if um, if channel channels change paths and are they going to be re re delineated um, on a regular basis or ad hoc or never? Yeah, yeah, okay, I, I see what you're getting at here. You know, <laughs> we're we're definitely. Uh, a little, we have our blinders on a little bit. You know, we're trying to get through a, a, a full national remap um, of of the Alaska and the U.S. and eventually the islands, I assume. Um, so, yeah, I, I guess we haven't really thought about you know what comes next um, after we have ingested EDH data into the three HP data model and we have national coverage. You know, what would happen then? Uh, I, I don't think I know. Um, we've kind of on on more acute scales, we have talked about what do we do when we have EDH in an area that's been ingested into 3DHP and then something happens, you know, a flood, uh, a construction event, you know, any of these major things that would have a, a big impact to the data. And, and we're, so we're working on those um, um, circumstances right now. You know, how do we do that? What, what tools do we need and what qualifies for a change and what doesn't um, as far as, any sort of like automated change detection, we we haven't gotten into that on, on our end. Um, certainly we have a lot of um, researchers and, and scientists that think through these problems and um, try and help us iron out a better way to do this in the future. But I, if that's what you're getting at, then um, I, I don't think we currently have anything um, in the fire for that. So as a follow-up, Josh, Josh is asking, is there a set process for providing feedback to the errors to the contractor and or yeah there is uh thank you for the question um so currently you know we've we've in, been improving constantly we've been improving our process uh how we do this and how we can make it more efficient and more you know direct um so it's gone through a few iterations but um kind of the spirit of this presentation is you know we have elevation products and we have hydrography products um, we want we want the data to be integrated, but we're all, we're also working a lot to be become more integrated programmatically. So um, really, the the process that has worked best for the three DEP program is um, error, you know robust error dictionaries um, and and simplified um, error reporting. So um, that's what we're moving towards. That's what we're working on right now. We we have a, a Conus version called the error. Um, Aero library or something like that. I can't remember what it is, uh, but we're we're updating that to be Conus and Alaska, and that's going to be an error dictionary that looks just like three depths. Um, so when a data producer submits their data to us for validation, um, we will send them back a report and tell them, you know, give give them the name of the error, and if they want to know more about what that means, then they can check the error dictionary for some examples and definitions of the error. Uh, but in our report back, we'll tell you, you know, you had 81 um, placement errors, you know, vertical placement errors, something like that, or, you know, some floating vertices. Um, and then we'll send your shapefile back. Um, with most of the error, shapefiles are pretty easy to look through. If, you know, if, you, if we tell you the name of the error and we send you a shapefile, it's um, pretty, pretty simple, pretty good back and forth. Um, I think, you know, I've been involved with this process for about three years now and, and I've seen huge, huge gains in um, efficiencies and, and our communication with our partners. And so I think it's getting better. But again, we're we're working on an updated error dictionary right now that'll really uh, help streamline the, the back and forth with our partners even more. Yeah, I'll just add Dennis has suggested that maybe we're really talking about data maintenance and manage maintenance rather than change detection per se. Um, Phil asks, can you provide a rough estimate of the validation time required for a typical hook? Um, I don't think I could. Um, 
and I'm probably not at liberty to say, but I, I'll I'll just say that it it definitely depends on um, the contractor, the area, the topography, the existing NHD, the quality of the dem. You know, there's so many things that it depends on. But just to give a um, a rough estimate of of that would be would be near impossible, mainly because um, we have had some data sets get submitted and accepted on their first submission. Uh, and then we have some that, you know, and this is this is not a slant towards anyone involved in this process, ourselves included, uh, but the process has gotten much better over time. You know, over the, it's been, you know, we started our pilots in 2019 and in those past five years, this stuff has gotten way better. You know, the community, the contractors, the government, we've all gotten better at this, but we've had some data go, I think the top is maybe six or seven correction rounds. Um, so to give you an estimate of what is in between would be near impossible. Sorry for that non-answer. I think we all recognize else, that. Um, oh, go ahead, Linda. I was. Just, I think we all recognize we're early in this process, and and you know, learning there is there are no norms yet, right? Yeah, you were getting there. You know, it's it's easy to to feel stuck in this phase, uh, but we won't be here forever. And I think we're all the time making um, strides ahead to to get out of, uh, or to, to move forward, get out, sounds terrible, my bad. Uh, you know, we're, we're moving the project forward all the time in in, in pretty, pretty substantial ways. Yeah. I'll give one last call for questions. We are at almost four o'clock. Seeing none, I uh, would like to thank our speakers today. Appreciate it. Uh, as everybody, as always, we'll follow up with uh, the Q&A doc as well as the recording of the um, presentation. And hopefully, and I know that that agencies can't always do this, but hopefully a, a PDF of the presentation as well. Uh, before we go, I just want to say, uh, just check in and remind you that the forum is the third Wednesday of every month. Um, except when we do an interest group meeting, which, as I mentioned, is going to be Tuesday, September 24th during the annual conference in person only. Um, if you have items you'd like to discuss or a forum topic, you can always reach out to me. And with that, I want to thank everybody for their participation and especially our, our speakers. And uh, thanks for the great questions. See you guys next month, hopefully in San Antonio. Thanks for having us, Linda. Mm, thank you. Thank you.